Hi, I'm uh, Zia Rahman. I am the founder and the CEO of Wanderly, uh, and this is based in California as well as based in Florida. And Wanderly is a marketplace and a platform as a service for the healthcare staffing industry, more specifically in the contingent healthcare staffing. Uh, as way of background, I am a technologist at heart and my degrees in computer science. Uh, so I started off my career in that sense, just to compress my career. Uh, I've run a lot of large companies as a CIO and CTO uh, of various companies, but I've gotten into the healthcare staffing side back in 2005. And I've helped build a couple of uh, large uh, staffing agencies in our space, Emerald Healthcare, uh, spent seven years there uh, building in uh, contingent healthcare staffing uh, software as well as the services, uh, did some merges and acquisitions in our space after that, and then uh, built another company called United Staffing Solution, uh, ran that for four or five years and exited that as well. So uh, in a nutshell, that's the background, but all along I've uh, always wanted to uh, build something that was uh, disruptive, but you know, the word disruption is, uh, is overused. So more importantly, it's how do I change the experience of the employee and the employer and remove a lot of the frictions in the middle. And we'll get into a lot of that, but uh, that's Absolutely. the uh, Reader's Digest version of my background. <laughs> that's awesome, Zia. And first of all, thanks so much for making time to join us on the Heavy Podcast. Super excited about this conversation. I know we've been playing this for, for a minute and things that you're building at Wonderly are so pertinent to all of the things that are going on in the market these days. So I can't wait to dive a little bit deeper onto that with you. Um, tell, me, tell us a little bit more about the opportunity that you saw in the market when you first set out to start a Wonderly and what is, what is the, the problem or kind of the, the value add that the company brings to, to its customers? Right. So, uh, you know, thinking about the worldwide healthcare uh, staffing industry. If you if you look at the market, the temporary staffing worldwide is it's about four hundred and sixty five billion dollar market, and within the United States, uh, it's roughly about twenty five billion dollar space. And the genesis of healthcare staffing and contingent healthcare staffing, and maybe uh, the audience is familiar with the terminologies travel nurses and travel allied locum tenants. These are really temporary workers that fill the positions as the census of a hospital goes up uh, and they need uh, temporary workers. And primarily, if you, unfortunately, if you visit any hospitals, one out of 10 nurses or doctors are temporary workers. And, and, and for many reasons why a hospital would, uh, would go ahead and secure staffing uh, in that nature. So that really started an industry in our space in the 90s, where the hospitals would go to staffing agencies to find uh, these types of workers. Uh, and of course, the workers over the period of time became much more interested in this because you know travel nursing allowed a full-time nurses, let's just focus on nurses, but it applies to doctors as well as allied professions, where they are now free and not tied to a particular hospital. So they can actually pick and choose where they want to work, travel the country, see the country. Uh, and, and, that's, and, and the pay is a little bit more than a, being a full-time employee. And you're not also dealing with stagnations of working at one hospital for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So that's really how this started. And then, as I mentioned that, you know, I ran Emerald Health Services for seven years as a staffing agency, got to see front and center the issues uh, that really was in this space. Uh, and, and most of the issues were primarily around the clinicians. Clinicians really did not have a choice to, yes, they can pick and choose where they would like to go, but they really could not negotiate what the pay would be unless and until they really committed themselves to an agency. And I saw that as an opportunity to empower the clinicians. And that led me uh, a few years down the road to start Wanderly, to address and really flip that. And, and so Wanderly effectively have become sort of like the kayaks of our industry, where the clinicians can then go and pick and choose which agency they want to work with or for, 
and they can pick and choose for the same job. They can compare what the different agencies are paying. That did not exist before Wanderly. So that's really one of the reasons why we started Wanderly. Uh, at the same time, we wanted a neutral platform so the clinicians can go to a neutral platform as opposed to just one agency and speak to them. And that was a, quite disruptive back in 2016, 2017. And that's how Wanderly started. And we fanned into all sorts of other areas uh, that are all commingled and interrelated from a services per perspective. That's super exciting. And thank you for sharing that back background story on, on uh, how it all came about. With you having spent quite a few years in staffing, moreover in healthcare staffing, um, you must do a lot of research, follow a lot of trends that are going on in your industry. What are some of the things that you you personally very excited about in terms of what's coming next, whether that's in healthcare or in staffing, or maybe you know specifically in healthcare staffing? Yeah, so you know healthcare in general, and more specifically healthcare staffing, a lot of the things that Wanderly was advocating in 2017, 2018, 2019 took a long time to resonate, and it really accelerated, unfortunately because of COVID. Because of COVID, the workforce, as you know, John, you know, the, especially the nurses and the doctors, given this pandemic, they were burnt out. You know, they, they were burnt out and you couldn't find enough people to go back to work. And people were working not only their standard shifts, you know, typical nurse works three days a week, 12 hours, you know, 36 hours a week. That turned into 100 hours a week because you just needed to work. and and given the pandemic, all, all those dangers that come along working in, the, in, in that situation. So I think, you know, when we started Wanderly, we wanted to empower the clinicians. Now, all of a sudden, the shortage of clinicians took place because of COVID. And that also forced the employers to recognize we need to improve a lot of the things from not only, uh, unfortunately, mental health, you know, supporting the behavioral health, as well as training, as well as making sure that, that they're paying well, because these were the core items that Wanderly was built on. We saw the acceleration of that. So I'm very excited that the, the clinicians are moving up the value chain, if you would, because before that in the contingent workforce, clinicians would deal with agencies, agencies would deal with another middleman, and that, that middleman will ultimately deal with the hospitals. So we see that collapse taking place, and Wanderly is at a very pivot point to really help these hospitals reduce cost, meaning the bill rates. Uh, you've heard and read a lot of, uh, and a lot of litigations that are taking place during pandemic. The bill rates just went from, st standard bill rates used to be $90, $95 to $250. And, and, and some people have to answer to that. Why? Did we pass it all to the clinicians or not? And when you read the, you know, uh, earnings of a lot of these companies and what you hear is not all the money went to the clinician. So by helping the clinicians move up closer to the employers, and that's really what Wanderly is empowering these guys is platform as a service. We have all these different service level that the hospitals can use and what we call direct sourcing, you know, really go directly to the hospitals to work. Uh, and that's really where I see the innovation taking place. And Wanderly has been talking about that. And the, uh, unfortunately, COVID accelerated that process. Right, right, absolutely. They can definitely relate on so many levels to all the things that you're talking about, especially coming out of pandemic. And we've seen a great um, innovation in the space of especially candidate onboarding, where it's a very complicated space when it comes to effectively onboarding your candidates. But when you add another layer of complexity doing that virtually, or maybe in some type of hybrid environment where half of your team is in physical locations and the other team is virtually, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that a lot of companies, most of the companies face. Share your thoughts on what are some of the advice or maybe practical recommendations that you share with your client companies, perhaps, when it comes to creating a frictionless experience for candidate onboarding in these hybrid environments. So most companies, uh, because of COVID, were forced to discover remote workforce, right? So you've got your own corporate workers that you have to hire and manage. And at the same time, in our business, we also have contingent workers, which are the clinicians that actually physically go and work at a hospital. So 
for us, honestly, and to be very frank, from day one, Wanderly was remotely built, right? All our employees were remote to begin with. So we didn't really experience ourselves in the challenges of, okay, here are all the employees at a corporate headquarters. How do we get them to work from home? And so we already had these things in place, but some of the challenges, and a lot of my friends have called me that, Zia, how did you do this? And, and what were some of the challenges? Of course, when you have all your workers all of a sudden going at home, first of all, you have infrastructure challenges, right? You've got all sorts of connectivity issues, you know, simple things that we don't think about for someone to work from home. We think, you know, just because you have an internet connection, you can work. But us being especially in the medical business where you're governed by, you know, regulations, rules and regulations and HIPAA and all of that confidentiality matters. So from an infrastructure perspective, a lot of people discovered VPN in a secure way of communicating, ensuring that the apps were primarily cloud-based. Uh, people's equipment at home. How do you deploy equipment at home? Most of the people came to work, you know, maybe at home they had laptops. So people had to figure that out. And at the same time, all the insurances, you know, when an employee works at home, you have to deal with workers' comp issues. You know, when an employee is working at home, what if the employee gets injured at home? What does that mean? You know, before you had professional liability, workers' comp in your corporate headquarter. So these are all the things I think now uh, insurance companies are attuned to what it takes to work from home. And I encourage all of you guys to work with your own carriers to figure that out. And it's an individual setting. Uh, but again, back to Wanderly, we were not only remote US-based, we were also remote internationally based. So that really helped us. Um, but that, that is definitely a challenge from an infrastructure, people, and also training. And also there is the core brain dump uh, mm -hmm. loss because when, you know, we're all human beings. When we're all together, that has a certain... Uh, levels of interaction that we have when we see each other eye to eye, facial uh, 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 facial recognition. That's why, uh, John, you know, what we do at Wanderly, which a lot of people didn't realize that we actually tell all our team members, you must be on Zoom when we're having a meeting, number one. Number two, you cannot be driving or at some dangerous location dialing in. So we force them to be visually uh, on the phone. And second is, is uh, making sure that uh, you've taken care of your own family business because when you're home-based, work-based, the life-work balance becomes even more challenging because mm -hmm. you could get away for eight hours and really be focused. Now you're at home. I'm sure you'll hear my dog somewhere, you know, wife walk by or, you know, all of those things. People have to learn how to manage and, and you have to have a HR folks and our HR people, you know, we are constantly sending them to training how to deal with remote workers. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge. Yeah, no question. Absolutely. We're still learning. So yeah. So so does everybody else. And it's interesting you touched upon some strategies for your own teams as you build and foster that culture of innovation, so to say. And you've mentioned that you had even started out even uh, outside of pandemic being being fully virtual. So when it comes to building and fostering that culture of continuous innovation, especially when, you, when, you, when your team is entirely 100% virtual, um, what are some of the you know, strategies that really help you instill and foster such, such an environment where your entire team is empowered to take any steps necessary to, to continuously evolve, continuously innovate? Because as an organization, the services that you guys provide, you have to constantly reinvent yourself, constantly innovate the services that you offer to your clients. Talk a little bit more from that perspective. Yeah, so, you know, to innovate, you got to have the most important ingredient, right? The people. Getting the right people to hire uh, is really number one. And, and I know we're not as big as IBM, as big as Apple, as big as, you know, other companies, but, you know, we're not terribly huge. Wanderly uh, has, you know, enough employees where every single person that we hire goes through a set of interview processes where it's very important to make sure they understand our core values. You know, it, it's core values are important because I'm looking for those diamonds in the rough to hire because people are going to help me innovate because I want those people that can come to the company and we actually 
have this uh, discussion every week, come up with a brand new idea once a week. There is no bad idea. That really helps us innovate. Uh, and, and you'll be surprised just having this once a week session with everyone. And obviously not when I say everyone, I mean departmental groups. And then we have an all hands meeting uh, every three months uh, where it's not just get together and give kudos. It's okay, tell me something that we need to learn from you. Most importantly, my focus really is to encourage the people to tell us what we're doing wrong. Everyone tells us what we're doing right. What are we doing wrong? Don't be afraid of knowing and learning what are you doing wrong. My job is to find that 5% that's not right with the company. And my job is to constantly listen to the customers and get that feedback loop going. So feedback loop is very important as part of the innovation. Listening to the customers and actually keeping them engaged is a challenge. So yeah, the core values and making sure the mission statements are clear. You gotta have your mission statement that is fully understood. Otherwise, you have anarchy in the company and they're running around and creating their own mission statements and every department is going with their own groove and what you have end up is somebody going this way and somebody's going this way and uh, strategy-wise, you fail. So, Right, right, absolutely. A lot of the things that you touched upon seem, seem very basic by oftentimes overlooked where you think of innovation being something very grandiose where in, in reality, you know, innovation could be in the form of you know, very small improvements to the current process or anything that also you had mentioned, uh, listening to the feedback of your customers could be a great source of innovation ideas. So that's that's super exciting. Some of the things that you share. Um, shifting focus a little bit more on the candidate side and also what you encounter probably on daily basis when it comes to interviewing and preparing the candidate and also the hiring manager for that first first time experience of meeting each other it's a very complex space and it's a lot of times based on what are the weaknesses that we can tolerate in that particular candidate versus what are the strengths missing on my team and overlooking the concept of that you know creating that two-way street for the candidate to also interview you and make their own determination share your thoughts on what what are some of the best practices that really helped you improve kind of that batting average when it comes to facilitating effective interviews you know it's interesting and 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 We've got healthy debates in, in, in this organization, but at the end of the day, working with the leadership, one thing that could be very strange, but we find that very beneficial and works for Wanderly. When we post our jobs to hire corporate employees, be it technology, be it HR, be it you know, uh, QA, development, product manager, you name it, all of these, we never post, and if we do, let me know, John, we never post the salary. We never post the salary because I think, you know, when you post the salary, you sometimes don't get the people you want because they say, oh, this just caps out here. So I'm looking for the people that qualify on those job descriptions. Uh, and my HR has that mandate. Do not post salary. Bring in as many through the net. And we may adjust our salary if you're that talented, you know. If we can afford it, of course, you know, there's no unlimited funds and it has to be market rate plus what you think is even more valuable. So that's one thing. We will not post uh, the salary for that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and all our leadership, and we have leadership meeting every Monday, religiously, 8 a.m. Pacific time, is when you're interviewing, tell your candidates why they shouldn't work for us. Tell them everything that you think is expected of them that could be something, a deal breaker. You know, we get together and one of the mistakes I used to make early on in my career is I interview and all I'm doing is talking about the company, talking about me, how good it is, trying to sell the company to that person. And I think instead of just selling, of course, they've applied because they've done some due diligence if they're a good candidate on the company. Don't sell. Tell him all the issues you have and all the things you would demand from that person and see if they still are up for the challenge, right? So, and can they deal with direct feedback? We're a completely transparent company. A lot of people cannot deal with direct feedback, you know, and, and, and I expect them to grow. And when I say, and if we're looking for just a developer, let's say, 
And a lot of the developers, we know they're, they're type of people and you have a lot of experience in the IT world, obviously. They just like, leave me alone. I want to code. I don't want to talk to anybody. If it's not written, I won't. That's great. But I'm also looking for a little bit more. And I challenge them saying, can you manage people? Are you willing to manage people? And, and, and they may not. But by asking and see what the responses are, you're looking for that people person also. Because I want that person to work in a team. Uh, and, and so we're looking for these things. So these are like intangible things I'm pushing and I'm training and working with all my leadership to make sure that these are the types of people that we're getting. And, 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 and that's really very important to me. And can they withstand fast paced? We live in a world now, things have to be really fast. Otherwise, uh, if you're the type of person that takes three weeks to think about something, uh, we're going to lose. Uh, uh, competitively. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if I answer a lot of your questions, but okay. there are some intangibles in here. Oh, bottom line, the other one, I must meet with every single person that we hire so far. Mm -hmm. Now it may become impossible after we're 400, 500 people as a company, uh, but I, I do make a point to walk the floor, so to speak. Now I walk the floor virtually. Uh, you know how Zoom has an option where you just click and it just starts ringing at the other side, just checking in and open door. I do get reverse uh, as well. My Zoom all of a sudden dings from someone that we don't have a planned meeting and you, you have to keep that two way door open. So yeah, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And to, to pull that thread a little bit further when it comes to retaining the top talent, that also creates a lot of opportunity for improving the world as an organization. Um, in this highly competitive market, there's a lot of opportunities for candidates, for workers all, you know, all over the world on a global scale. And to create and foster such environment of high retention of very, you know, very talented, talented individuals is, is becoming a challenge. So what are your thoughts on that? What are some of the things that really help you succeed in that space? Yeah, I mean, some, some of the answers would be uh, similar. I, it's it's the, the world has changed where the millennials of today and, and Gen Zs, um, you know, the challenge is retaining them. And, 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 and I find that it's not just the money. They want the money, yes. It's not just the money. You have to give them a career path. You have to make them not only career path. In my, when I was growing up, career path meant, okay, I'm this. What's my next title? What's my next title? What's my next title? That has changed. And we need to recognize that title is important, but what they want is to be able to affect change. They want to affect change in the department, in the organization, in the company they work for. They want to leave a fingerprint of this is what I helped change the company. And so, you know, us being a technology company, even the developers, you know, who are just sitting there by themselves working or the vice presidents you know, I, I want all of them to do this feedback in the company and say, that was my idea that got implemented. And, and, and I think you get more from those people and we overuse this. Yes, we want a feedback loop. We want to listen. We have an open door policy. But if you can concretely take that idea and make that change, be an HR change, be a benefits change, be a technology change, uh, be a process change, training tools they're always looking for tools and training let them come to you and say what tool do you think we need you know we're so used to like us as leaders going and getting the tools saying you are going to be trained in that right so that all of that feedback has changed it's no longer pushing things to your employees it's really them giving you you assess it there's a budget you have to work with the reality of that we all have budgets mm -hmm but you have to return that. And, and, and I think you get more of those people that feel ownership in the company. And ownership is no longer just, do I have an equity in the company? Ownership is how do I affect change? And if you do that, all, uh, you will have a lot of satisfied uh, team members. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and just the, what you've touched upon resonates on so many levels when it comes to prescribing certain things, whether that's policies, procedures, or even the tools that your organization uses. I think soliciting that feedback from your employees, it's, it's a, a lot of times overlooked strategy that could be a great source of a lot of the great ideas. So that makes perfect sense. 
um, when it comes to your personal development as a leader, as a, as as the C level executive, as a founder of your organization, what are some of the things that you consume on daily basis? What is your content diet looking like these days to keep yourself educated, to keep yourself maybe even motivated um, on all the things that are going on in your industry, or maybe with 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 yourself as a leader? Yeah, that's that's a very good very good point, and I think you know beyond reading some books, and we all have very limited time now. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like an information overload. So you really have to curate what you take in. And I am always, I start with this premise and I try to do this as best as I can. I want to learn something new, three things new every day. And this really goes back to, I remember my father, you know, learn three new words every day. That's how he started with me when I was young. Tell me three new words and what they mean and use it in a sentence. That's how I grew up. So I kind of carry that forward. I would like to wake up every day and learn three new things professionally or personally and whatnot. So speaking professionally, I'll start my day off and I'm a news junkie. So I will touch on at least four or five different types of news site just to take in how the world is happening. Primarily business related news. You know, I could be on, you know, Financial Times to CNBC to Business Week. That's a religious thing I do around 5 30, 6 o'clock every morning. Uh, and after that, I'll be scouring LinkedIn. And I belong to a lot of different groups uh, and see what conversation is going on. It really starts with conversation. And if you read people's comment, you can get some information. And then to me, most important are blogs. I am on a lot of blogs and I'm reading a lot of different blogs, be it competitor blogs. Uh, any type of generic blog, industry blog, and just reading and see what they're writing about, you know? And you always have to run it through your own filter, right? We all know there's a lot of information out there and how you absorb that and use that is very important. And of course, you know, industry trade magazines or which is in these cases are sites. So we belong to staffing industry analysts. So I'm always there reading research. Uh, I try to read at least two to three uh, research documents uh, gives me some data points. You know, I've, I've got a lot of EQ, but I really need to quantify that with real data point to see, you know, uh, am, I, am I on the right path? And conferences, you cannot go to enough conferences. And even if you go to conferences, and we all know how conferences are, even sitting at the bar at a conference and just chatting up with people, you learn a lot. And of course, you know, conferences are important from a vendor perspective, you know, what, what are the new things? So it's, it's all around. There's no one thing and you have to find what works for you uh, and, and move forward on that. That's super exciting. Seems like a very diverse strategy when it comes to, I'm always fascinated by the strategies to keep your mind, you know, protected almost with what you said, the information overload and with so much content being thrown at us on a daily basis it could definitely become overwhelming. So I like some of the compartmentalization that you go through when it comes to being able to surround yourself with the content that really helps you grow as a person, as a leader, as an individual. So that makes sense. And honestly, I'll add one more thing, John. Yeah. I wish I could say this. If something is 10 pages, it doesn't mean I'm reading every word in 10 pages, right? It's just, it's just like, okay, this paragraph looks good. I'm going to read it seriously. Next paragraph looks boring, moving on. So as you mature, I think you do that a lot. So uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm exactly the same way. I do a lot of scanning and some of the things yeah. that really do stand out, uh, then I dive a little bit deeper highlight. But as, as you said, there's also a lot of kind of fluff, so to say, that really goes around the, the true meat of you trying to consume. Yeah. Um, to take you a little bit back in your career, just to just get your mindset from that perspective, in terms of mentorship that you had received early on in your career and some of the advice that you may have received or series of advice as a young professional that really helped you throughout your career that you even refer back to even these days and use that to mentor others within your circles. Talk a little bit more from that perspective. What are some of the things that really stood out that you still find very important these days? Yeah, uh, that is a very weighted question. So <laughs> it is, absolutely is. And it throws a lot of the guests off because it really forces you to kind of go back to your early days and some of the things that really kind of resonated even throughout the, as you were growing as a professional. 
I think I think uh, it's a combination of few people. I mentor on a personal level, mentor on a professional level. So for me, there is no no other on a personal level. My father as as a personal mentor, and I think I gave you some examples that my father did, and 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 good or bad, he was very focused on business and work. Actually, he didn't have a business; he worked and my vision of him is always working, right? So I think somehow that got instilled in me for better or for worse. And I've always remember him reading all the time. And uh, he always told me one thing that no matter what you do, Zia, be the best at it. And so I remember, if you want to call, I started my career flipping burgers when I was 16 years old. <laughs> you know, I, I would come home and say, dad, I, you know, I made all these burgers. And he would say, did you do your best to make the burger? And I always tried to be the fastest burger flipper, fastest burger maker, you name it. So that to this day is I want to be the best at what I do. And it's a simple laughing matter, but I, I think that's been instilled in me. And from the EQ side, I think I get a lot of that from my mother's side, uh, uh, from my mother. So I take the soft side from my mother and then really work side from my father. But professionally, really, I think, you know, I have to, really say there are a couple of people who have made major impacts uh, uh, mentoring me. And one gentleman, he happens to be on our board also. It's funny how life works. Uh, I started my career with him. He was a very senior executive. His name is Larry Albert, and he's on our board. And I've learned a lot from him. Uh, and also uh, another gentleman who's also on our board, uh, Mark Silverman, I've learned a lot. These are personal mentors to me professionally. Uh, they've done this many, many times before, built companies, exited, and you can learn a lot from these guys mentoring you uh, at, at a close level. But, uh, and other than that, you know, from a, knowing people indirectly, if you want to call them, you know, in, inspirations and all of that, and I can tell you some examples of that, but this is the closest as far as mentoring. That's great. That's great. And I, I realize it's it's a it's a it's a loaded question and it's, it you know, forces you to think back from that perspective. But a lot of times powerful words like that do come out in terms of what are some of the things that really helped you throughout your career that you still refer to even these days. So that that makes perfect I mean, sense. It's, it's John, it's it's, uh, you know, businesses, you're an entrepreneur. Businesses are it's a matter of when things look chaotic things become chaotic, you know, it's a matter, we've all been through, oh my God, I have to meet payroll and I have to do this, you know, client hasn't paid me, you know, DSOs are 99 days, you know, where am I going to get the money? That's when you need to know what your North is. Mm -hmm. And to me, my North is always my family or the parents. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I look back, okay, what would, you know, in my way, you know, what did I learn from Larry? What did I learn from Mark? You know, how do I stay stable? And as long as you have your north, I think rest will work out. Yeah. Uh, health is important. Uh, of course. Yeah. Health is important too. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I love that, Zia. And, you know, it was a very short and insightful conversation. I, I personally learned quite a bit. So I definitely thank you for your time today. What I love doing with all the guests on the podcast is scheduled a follow-up recording in about a year where we revisit the conversation from a year ago and see if everything we've discussed still makes sense, still applies. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing that with you as well. Well, thank you very much for inviting, John. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Zia. All right. Take care.